Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Eric Ball Cabbage. I am a doctor of chiropractic, functional medicine practitioner, certified nutrition specialist, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about oxidative stress, NRF2, and sulforaphane. The biggest challenge of our time currently is that we are constantly bombarded by toxins from the environment and from free radicals that are produced by just the normal processes of the body. What we've learned over time is that the accumulation of these free radicals produce or can produce what we call oxidative stress. And as you know, or as we've been taught, oxidative stress damages cells, and that's what leads to a lot of chronic healthcare challenges we have today. We know that, ox that excessive reactive oxygen species, excessive reactive nitrogen species can damage DNA, damage your lipids, damage your proteins. It can cause the blood-brain barrier permeability to increase. It can increase the inflammatory pathways. It can increase the degenerative changes in the body, and it can increase apoptosis. We know that when we trigger these inflammatory pathways, this is a major challenge because chronic low-grade inflammation is the leading cause of almost every healthcare challenge we have today. And it becomes a vicious cycle. So we get free radical formation that overwhelms our antioxidant, anti-inflammatory system. It creates oxidative stress. That oxidative stress triggers more inflammation. The inflammation then drives dysfunction and disease. And then the disease, triggers more oxidative stress, more inflammation, and it becomes this vicious cycle. And so sometimes there's this rush to reduce inflammation and to get rid of all the reactive oxygen species. And people are over-consuming anti-inflammatories and antioxidants to some degree because they want to get rid of it. But we have to remember that there is some benefit to inflammation in these free radicals. I mean, they help us keep bacteria and microbes under control. They help us with the detoxification of the toxins that we're constantly being bombarded with. They help us repair damaged tissue. I mean, if you go to the gym, you work out, part of the process is to break down your muscles, to break down your tissues, so that you can rebuild them bigger and stronger. And we need some level of inflammation and oxidative stress to support the healing and repair process. Without it, we don't heal, we don't repair. So we need some. So when we talk about health, it's really not a process of not having any inflammation or any oxidative stress. It's about balancing the reactive oxygen species and the inflammation they create with our antioxidant system and the anti-inflammatory those things can have. So we really need a balance. It's not an all or none process. And so how do we, what's the best way to really support or address the inflammation and the oxidative stress? Well, we've got a couple things that we can do. One of those is to reduce or remove as many of those stressors as possible, right? We can support with direct anti-inflammatory and antioxidants, or we can support the body's natural innate process of producing anti-inflammatories and antioxidants. So there's a couple concepts that we need to discuss and to talk about. And one of those is this process called hormesis. And there's a saying that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Have you heard that term before? And so the issue with that is, is that we need some stress in our life. Everybody's talking about, hey, I don't want any stress. How do I get rid of all the stress? And the reality is you need some stress in your life. When you stress the cells, you stress the tissues, it helps the tissues have more defense. One of the biggest challenges we see is people are so worried about germs that they really don't develop a really solid immune system. And so we need some level of, of stress to make us stronger, to make us tougher. And that's, this, that's what hormesis is. It's our body's adaptive response to some level of stress, which in time actually makes us stronger, more adaptable when more significant stresses come on board. So there is a sweet spot though. So if you don't have any stress, that's problematic. If you have too much stress, that's also problematic. So what we really want to do is find the sweet spot. And so another term we have to consider is this concept of homeostasis. And homeostasis is our body's ability to auto-regulate and maintain our environment with the energy that we produce in it, when we're in a state, in a, into a stable state, right? And so we're always trying to kind of maintain balance. And that's what we call homeostasis. So in a low-stress state, we can adapt 
all the systems work kind of evenly with the amount of energy we produce in any given day. And then we have this other term that's called allostasis. And allostasis is the adaptive shift of our adapt adaptation to stress. So when we have excessive levels of stress on the system, we only make, we make a finite amount of energy in any given day, and the body has to shut down or reduce the function of some systems in an effort to deal with the threat. I often explain it, if you were cooking, right, and you were making food for your family, and somebody broke into your house and started attacking you or your family, you would stop the cooking, hopefully, right? And then you would start to defend. And the body does the same thing. It stops doing some of the tasks that are most important for growth and development, and then shifts its energy to deal with the threat and the defense response. So allostasis is this shift of taking energy away from some, maybe some important processes and shifting that towards something else. And so, in our environment today, the problem is, I don't know how many of us are really in a stable homeostatic state. I think so many of us are fighting the chronic stress that we're put on from our environment and from what's going on within that we're really always in an allostatic state. And I like to explain it like the old school teeter-totter. Most people, we're on that teeter-totter, we've got bad stress, we've got good stress, we balance ourselves out, that's good. The challenge is we've got, in our lives today, we've got so many things that are creating bad stress on one end of that teeter-totter that we have to adapt. And we can do it, and we can do it for a while. And yeah, the teeter-totter leans, but we just lean the other way, and we can kind of adapt. The problem is, as I lean and adapt, my one leg has to work much harder to keep me stable. It takes a lot more work to keep that teeter-totter stable, and in time, I break down. I fail. I fatigue. Systems start to break down, and that's where we're at. We're not in this state of homeostasis due to this bombardment of stressors and toxins. So many of us live in a state of allostasis. And there's two more terms we have to talk about. One of those is allostatic load. And so if you think about the allostatic load, that's all the things that you're being kind of pushed, that are pushing you on a daily basis. It's the work stress, it's the emotional stress, it's relationship stress, it's organisms, it's all of these things that you need to adapt to. And if we consider that if we had a, a pickup truck that had a certain amount of weight, that it's made for 2,000 pounds, 2,500 pounds, and we put 2,000 or 2,500 pounds or less in that, that would be our homeostatic load. That's what the truck is designed to manage. The allostatic load would be if we overloaded that truck and the truck was overburdened. We put 5,000, 10,000 pounds in that truck. Now, it may go down the road, but how long it goes down the road and how well it goes down the road is the question, right? And so it's the, allostate, it's the allostatic load is everything that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And then the last term is something called the allostatic overload. And that's when we put either too much stress on the system and the system breaks, or dealing with an allostatic load, all of these stressors over an extended period of time just eventually breaks us down. And that's what so many of us see in our patient practices, is when we start asking people when they started to have the problems and the signs and the symptoms, they don't really know. They're not really sure. Because it's been a slow, progressive load over time. For some people, they know. They know that, hey, I had a divorce. I had a, a car accident. I had this major life issue that triggered beginnings of my problem. But for so many of us, it's a constant chronic buildup of stressors over time that really breaks us down. And so the next concept we want to kind of consider is something called the cell danger response. And there's a great paper, it's written by Dr. Robert Navio, who talks about the cell danger response. And when we talk about what that is, your cells and tissues are just like us. You think of them like little people. And so when a cell is is challenged with excessive stress, it slows down or shifts itself from its homeostatic regulating system 
and shifts to more of an allostatic regulating system. It goes from growth and development into self-defense. And we see a number of processes occur as a result of this, not by accident, not by just chance, not by a system that's gone out of control, but much of what we see in illness is not a mistake, but the natural consequence of excessive stress. And inflammation and oxidative stress are, are some of those things we actually see not necessarily, at least in the early stage, as the problem, but as the cell's ability to try and adapt. And so what we see is under different phases of homeostasis versus allostasis, or when somebody's in a cell danger response, things that we want to have happen don't always work out the way we want. We take a, we take a medication, or we take a supplement, or we take a vitamin, and we're expecting one result, and we get something totally different. Why? Because in a homeostatic state, in a non-stress state, that nutrient may go to help us grow and develop what we really want for our patients or what our patients want. But in a stress state or in a cell danger state, the body's doing something totally different with that, maybe driving more inflammatory oxidative states, not by accident, but on total purpose to deal with the threat. And so what I see happening is that so many of us are in this cell danger response. And I shouldn't, I wanna make sure I, under, I explain that the cell danger response isn't a bad thing. If you get a bacteria or a virus, you want this cell danger response to kick in. You want the cell to wall itself off, to slow down glucose transport into the cell, to slow down uh, cell metabolism by deactivating thyroid hormone. You want that to happen because the, all the actions of the cell danger response are all in an effort to kill the threat. And that's great if that threat is a bacteria or a virus or a toxin that's short term, the challenge becomes if it becomes long term and persistent. And what we see is if it's short term, the cell danger response can, kicks in, walls off the bacteria, the virus, the toxin, it addresses it, and we go back into a healing response. And we go back to normal. That's good, we want the cell danger response. The challenge is, if the stress is persistent, if it's not necessarily just a bacteria, or just a virus, but it's emotional, it's past trauma, it's all of these things constantly stressing the cells and the tissues, they never get a chance to get into a healing response. And now we have the these cells not just the cells, but cells, tissues, the whole body is driven into this totally changed physiology, this allostatic state, and so the body has to adapt. And so we have systems like, if I'm in fight or flight mode, do I need hormones to really be produced? I, that's not really what I need in the moment. If I'm in fight or flight mode, I don't necessarily need my GI tract to be functioning, moving, and digesting. I'm trying to put energy to things that are gonna keep me alive and survive, and what we see in clinical practice with our patients is they start to have multiple systems that start to become compromised, right? And so they may have GI symptoms, and they may have thyroid symptoms, and cardiovascular symptoms, and adrenal systems, systems, and they may have imbalances with neurotransmitters. And we look at each one of those issues like it's the problem, when in reality, our body is down-regulating some of these processes or up-regulating those processes in an effort to defend us. And so we have to be cautious because many times what we're doing both in allopathic medicine and functional medicine is we see the symptom and we consider it the disorder or the problem and we treat it. And if we treat the symptom, we have to be aware that each drug, supplement, or whatever we're providing the patient has an intended consequence intended uh, action, but it can also have unintended consequences. And many times what we use to treat and kind of inhibit what's going on actually becomes what? Another stress added to the process. So we have physical stress, chemical stress, emotional stress. We have microbial stress, we have environmental stress. All these things contribute, but many times what I see is that the management of the signs and symptoms of root cause issues winds up becoming another stress on the system. And so what, what I tell my patients when they come ask me, like, 
what is it that I have? And because we all love something to identify with, whether it's fibromyalgia or IBS, we like to you know, have something we can hug and hold on to and say, this is what I have. I don't like to diagnose, I don't like to tell somebody they have something because I don't want them living up to their disease state or their disordered state or to their symptoms. But if I really had to give them an answer, I call what they have multi-system adaptive disorder. And to me, it makes the most sense for what most of us are all experiencing. I'm chronically tired, I'm chronically fatigued, my, my, my cortisol is not regulating well, regulating well, my GI tract's not working well. Right, because those systems aren't critical to survival. And so what the body's trying to do, just like the housewife who's trying to protect her family, the, the food is going to burn, right? Because what the body is doing is trying to protect itself. What the individual cells are trying to do is to protect themselves. And so the question becomes, if we've got these cells that are trying to protect themselves, they're actually increasing inflammation, they're increasing oxidative stress to try and kill the threat, how do we, how do we balance out doing too much and overwhelming the system and actually inhibiting what the body is actually trying to do to protect itself, but yet still help our patients and give them some support. And so we really have two primary strategies in, in, from a treatment perspective. One is to give you direct anti-inflammatory products or direct antioxidants or to support the body's natural cell defense. And so one of the things that is really an important piece to keep in mind, especially if you're using a lot of antioxidants is if we have this thing called a free radical, right? It is, it's missing an electron, which makes it this kind of volatile thing and create damage. But we give somebody an antioxidant, which is then willing to donate an electron. Now what are we left with? That antioxidant can now become the next free radical. And so then we have to be able to manage that, right? And so there can be some problems with loading the body with anti-inflammatory uh, and antioxidant products. There's something called SOD, which is really good because it can catalyze superoxide. The problem is it then produces something called hydrogen peroxide, which now we have to deal with and address. Uh, we can provide somebody an acetylcysteine, and many of us have done that, but it can actually inhibit the body's natural, innate, major master regulator of the antioxidant anti-inflammatory system, something called NRF2. We can provide somebody with glutathione, but we have to be then able to recycle that glutathione or it too can become problematic. We could use high dose vitamin C to recycle the glutathione, but high dose vitamin C may have a negative impact and, and create some damage to DNA. And so we just have to be aware that when we're giving a lot of antioxidant, one-off antioxidant products, they, they can donate, they can have a benefit, but is that beneficial to do that long term? And then do we have the systems in place to deal with what happens as a result of pounding somebody with an individual antioxidant? So we have to remember by blasting somebody some at times with high dose anti-inflammatory and antioxidants, it can lead to bacterial overgrowth, right? And so if we're constantly taking away the body's natural defense system, bacteria can overgrow. Uh, as I said, the antioxidant can become a prooxidant. There's a hormetic effect for all of these things, so too little, not so good, but too much can be problematic. Many of these products that we take as antioxidants to support our patients and anti-inflammatories can inhibit the body's NRF2 system, which is our body's natural system. And the NRF2 system, when it's turned on, when it's activated, it turns on 200 enzymatic reactions. So do we want it to be supporting one, or is it beneficial, more beneficial to support 200 pathways? So some of the products that are out there on the market are things we want to use, but they're, they're, they have low absorption and low bioavailability. And many of these things can actually inhibit the body's natural detoxification pathways. 
So we also see that they can reduce the innate cell protection. They can increase the rate of infection if we take these for extended periods of time, and they can reduce the appropriate repair and regenerative process. So short term, these things may be very beneficial, but I, I caution people to be taking these things for an extended period of time, long periods of time. We all have those patients who decide that they are going to take two Advil before they go play golf. And then they're going to come home from playing golf and they're going to take another two Advil. And this becomes a daily ritual where they're constantly bombarding themselves with anti-inflammatory type products, not realizing that what's going to allow the tissue that they tore up playing golf or lifting weights or doing whatever their exercise, they needed that inflammation for the tissue to break down, to stimulate the stem cells, to come do the repair job they're supposed to do. And five, 10 years after doing this, not only is maybe their GI tract, their liver, and, and their renal system having some compromise, but they're struggling with chronic arthritic damage, the very thing they took it for in the first place. So one of the, those things we need to consider, is there any other way that we can support the level of reactive oxygen species that maybe has nothing to do with drugs or supplementation? And the answer to that is, yeah, there is. It's usually not the things that many people want to do, though. Caloric restriction has been shown to have a great benefit on reducing the level of oxidative stress, stress on the system, as well as supporting natural, good gut health, blood sugar regulation, fat mobilization, and exercise, right? Low, not excessive exercise, but adequate amounts of exercise can have a super benefit to managing oxidative stress. Again, too little, not good. Excessive, not good. You really want to find that sweet spot. So what do we do? I mean, what's the best way to support our patients who have chronic inflammation and oxidative stress? And I would say in the long run, one of the best things to do is support what we call the NRF2 pathway. That's our body's natural, innate way to support anti -infl inflammation, support our antioxidant system, and support our detoxification systems. NRF2 is really the master regulator, because once that turns on, it turns on so many processes. And so how this works is the NRF2 pathway is really, in, when there's low stress, low levels of oxidative stress, low levels of inflammation, the NRF2 system is, is kind of inhibited. But when there's excessive oxidative stress, NRF2, which is usually kept quiet by something called KEEP1, becomes released from that KEEP1. The NRF2 can then move into the nucleus and then generate our anti-inflammatory products and our antioxidant products. So some of the things that NRF2 has been shown to do is it increases our antioxidants, it helps us metabolize drugs and proteins, it increases drugs eflux, drug efflux pumps, it increases something called heat shock proteins, which are things that drive up heat in the body, it increases the NADPH regenerative enzymes that help us with antioxidation. It increases growth factors and growth factor receptors. It antagonizes NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B is the big driver of the inflammatory system. So NRF2 and NF-kappa B are, these, are back on our teeter-totter, the two things that we need to have balanced out. What often happens is we get excessive NF-kappa B, which actually can inhibit NRF2 if it's long term. So we, we really want to balance these things, do two things out. And NRF2 actually antagonizes NF-kappa kappa B, which then slows down the process. So typically, if you have an injury or you break down the muscle tissue, that triggers NF-kappa B to be released. That triggers your inflammatory process to start the natural process of healing and repair. And those inflammatory molecules then trigger the release of NRF2. NRF, NRF2 is released and starts the healing process and shuts off the inflammatory process. So it's, it's beautiful design is what it is. The problem is when we're constantly bombarded by stressors, we are in constant cell danger response, then the NF-kappa B system just becomes overloaded and sustained, and that can actually inhibit and shut down our NRF2 system. 
NRF2 has also been shown to increase heavy metal binding of proteins. It increases ferritin and controls intracellular free iron, which is critical to keeping bacteria and other organisms under control. It increases PPAR. It increases itself if it needs to. It increases VDR expression. So for so many docs out there who are seeing patients who have chronically low 25 vitamin D, it's critical that you understand this piece because if we have chronic inflammation that's in, in suppressing NRF2, then NRF2 doesn't drive enough production of VDR. And so the vitamin D we provide our patients or the vitamin D that the patients are getting from exposure to sun, it can't be used. And I, the question that I'm often asked is, why is everybody so deficient in vitamin D? And I don't know that we're necessarily so deficient. I just think we're not evaluating it the way it should be evaluated because what I see in clinical practice is many of my patients are overloaded with not 25 OHD, which is typically measured, but 125 vitamin D, which is the activated form of vitamin D. And in cases where there's lower 25 vitamin D and elevated 125 vitamin D, it may be that those levels are elevated because that VDR receptor isn't working, because the NRF2 system isn't working appropriately and there's not enough functional VDR to support vitamin D binding and doing its actions. What most of us, what I didn't know early on was that those bacteria and those viruses can actually hijack the VDR receptor, making it useless. It doesn't work. And so if you don't have NRF2 to make more VDR and you have bacteria or viruses that inhibit its function, vitamin D becomes almost useless. And actually the supplementing of more vitamin D actually can create a massive drain on the magnesium that so many of us and our patients are already deficient in. And so the big question becomes, if we have this NRF2 system and it's supposed to be the big player here, why am I still loaded with oxidative stress and inflammation? Why are all my patients loaded with these things? And the big challenge is that NRF2 can be inhibited or exhausted. And so there's things that allow or drive in the NRF2 system. And one of the big things that drives the NRF2 system is something called thyroid hormone. Anybody who has, got, who has low levels of T3 inside their cells is going to have a decreased activation of their NRF2 system. You need, your patients need T3 inside their cells to drive NRF2 into the nucleus of the cell to produce all those anti-inflammatory products, to produce all those antioxidants, to support detoxification. So when a cell is in a hypothyroid state, the ability of NRF2 to work goes down. And so we might consider, is this a mistake by the body that the body just lost control, or is this beautiful design? If we think about it, if you have a bacteria or a virus inside your cell, the cell is trying to increase inflammation, increase oxidative stress to protect itself, but also to signal to all the other cells in the body that, hey, I've got a bacteria, I've got a virus, take action. And so maybe the goal there is not to have a lot of NRF2 being driven because the cells are still trying to kill the threat. If it's short term, yeah, we want the system to kick in and then shut down. But what if it's chronic? What if I have chronic emotional stress? What if you're not sleeping every night? What if you have disordered breathing? What if you just have toxicity in the body and it's unrelenting stress? that drives the cell danger response that causes thyroid hormone to be deactivated, that NRF2 system can become inhibited. If somebody is taking things like NAC or other antioxidants to support individual pathways in the antioxidant system, those products can cause a feedback that actually shuts down NRF2. So in an attempt to support your glutathione production, but you take NAC, Small doses might maybe not a big deal, but taking heavier doses for an extended period of time actually tells the body that, hey, I've got plenty of NAC. I don't, we don't need to support this pathway because I got all this NAC in the system and NRF2 gets shut down. And now not one system may get shut down, but all 
the antioxidant, anti-inflammatory systems get slowed down. And then as I said, NF-kappa B itself can inhibit the NRF2 system. And NF-kappa B is one of those things that can be driven by one of the, by other inflammatory proteins and something called lipopolysaccharides, which comes off of our bacteria. There's gram-negative gram bacteria when they overgrow, where you have this process called dysbiosis that so many of us are familiar with. The, the outer shell, the outer coating of those bacteria can, can drive the NF-kappa B system. And if you have systemic infections that are just, or gut infections that are out of control, and we have the success of LPS and LTA being secreted, that will be the constant driver that inhibits at the NRF2 system. So the question becomes, is there a way to upregulate the NRF2 system more naturally? And there is. We talk about exercise is a great way to increase the NRF2 system. Again, within reason, right? No exercise, you don't get much stimulation, but if you're doing chronic, sustained, excessive exercise, as I learned, that too becomes a problem. Caloric restriction, time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting can be a very effective way to upregulate the NRF2 system. And then there's a number of phytochemicals, curcumin, stilbins, catechins, and sulforaphane can all upregulate the NRF2 system. The challenge becomes bioavailability. And what we see in the literature and the research is that the viability of those, a lot of these phytochemicals is not great. So forophane has about an 80% bioavailability, very absorbable into the system and very, and very usable. When we think about, there's something called the CD value, and that CD value refers to the concentration of a compound required to double the activity of phase two detoxification enzyme quinone reductase. And so when you think about how much is needed, one of the real popular products on the market is resveratrol. It has a, va a CD value of 30. If we compare that to something like sulforaphane, its CD value is barely a blip. It's less than five. So you need much less sulforaphane to double the quinone reductase than you need something like resveratrol. So you can get more bang for your buck from sulforaphane than a lot of these other anti or phytochemicals that you can support NRF2. So what is sulforaphane? Sulforaphane is an isothiocyanate. It's actually a, a a product that is driven by the combination of a couple components within plant-based material. So within the brassica family, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, there's a, there's a component called glucoraphanin, and there's an enzyme within, these, within the plant, and when these two pieces come together when the plant breaks down, the myrosinase binds to the, or reacts with the glucoraphanin, and it produces this product called sulforaphane. It's short-lived, doesn't last long, but it, has a, it packs a big punch. So sulforaphane has been identified as a way to help support antioxidants, is to be, or to be considered an antioxidant. It's considered to be able to be an antimicrobial, be anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, anti-aging, neuroprotective, and anti-diabetic. And you wonder, how could this product that comes from this plant do so much? It's indirect, so by stimulating this NRF2 pathway, it can actually support all these processes. But if we look at it really simply, all of these things, cancer, aging, neurodegenerative conditions, diabetes, they're all driven by what? Chronic excessive inflammation and oxidative stress. And so, where can we get the sulforaphane? What the literature is showing is one of the highest, one of the places we get the highest concentration or, or, or benefit of sulforaphane seems to come from broccoli sprouts. The three to five day sprouts of broccoli. Not the big head you buy in the grocery store, but the three to five day sprout. When, the, when that sprout is three to five days old, that's when we get the biggest bang for our buck is out of those young product, those young sprouts. 
The benefit of sulforaphane is that it enters the, the enterocytes very easily through active diffusion. Another benefit is that it's sulforaphane and its metabolites don't last long in the body. So for some of these things, our concern is if we give something, is there any potential that it can hang around in the body too long and create problems? And sulforaphane and its metabolites really only last in the body about 24 hours. As I said, it's super absorbable and it's been shown that within 15 minutes of consuming sulforaphane, it's actually, it can actually be crossing the blood-brain barrier. So we can get it into the tissues really effectively. So forfain helps to keep that NRF2 active. So if it's being inhibited by excessive levels of inflammation, so forfain can actually block the NF kappa B from inhibiting NRF2 and, and restart the NRF2 system. It increases glutathione, it increases quinone reductase, it increases hydrogen sulfide in the system. What's interesting is it also inhibits aromatase, which is one of the biggest challenges when we have chronic inflammation in the system, we get upregulation of the aromatase system, which then takes things like testosterone and converts them into more estrogen. And for those of us who are guys, we go from having packs to moves, not necessarily something we're all looking for. Blocks NF kappa B, blocks IL 6. So sulforaphane does so many things that can really be supportive for our patients, but it really does most of it indirectly. It does it by driving the NRF2 system and, it's a, and the chance of toxicity is very low. So where can you, where can you get sulforaphane? Well, you've got a couple options. One of those things that you can do, you can grow broccoli sprouts. You can grow them in your kitchen, grow them in some mason jars, you can grow them in some high quality soil and within three to five days you have broccoli sprouts and if you eat those three to five day old broccoli sprouts you'll be getting your sulforaphane. I do not recommend buying them at Whole Foods or any of those other stores because they don't sit on the shelf very long. As soon as that sprout starts to break down, the sulforaphane is made and then it's gone. So your best bet is if you're going to try and get this from plant-based material, grow your own sprouts if you're gonna do, if you're gonna, if you're gonna take the sprouts and eat them, which is a great idea. You could, get supplements. The challenge that I found as I was trying to utilize products that were on the market is many of the, the quality of many of the products isn't what, what I thought it was when I, when I would purchase it. The big challenge for many of these products is, is that they're, they're, pro, they're heat processed. And so when you heat the product to try and get this raw product, it actually denatures or destroys the enzyme, the morosinase enzyme. And so there is no morosinase in many of these what we call broccoli seed extract products and without that morosinase the glucoraphanin is going to have very little benefit there is an argument by some that you don't need the morosinase because if you some of us have bacteria in our gi tract that will either produce morosinase or an enzyme that will break that will convert the glucoraphanin into sulforaphane but most of most of our patients are walking around with chronic GI issues. How do we know or how do we quantify that they have the type or the amount of bacteria that actually can do that action? I think that's a big ask for people who, let's face it, they are they're struggling with chronic GI issues, most of the people we see. So we, we can't really consider that they're going to be able to have the ability to to convert glucoraphanin into sulforaphane based on their gut flora. It just, it's, it just doesn't make sense. And so what I needed to do was to find a product that I thought would be, have what we wanted, a product that would be able to provide a clean source of broccoli extract that had a stable myrosinase enzyme in it. And so what I needed to do was find a, a partner to help me do that. And I, I found that in US Enzymes, I found that in Tomorrow's Nutrition Pro, uh, and we were able to formulate sulforazine. And sulforazine is a unique product. It was a very difficult product to, to get to fruition because getting clean product um, was very difficult. Getting a product that had stable myrosinase was a very difficult process. And then when we did find it, we had the benefit of having 
uh, the ability to add an enzyme, a product called Astrozyme, which is a proprietary blend that can help this product even do more than we thought it would be, it could do with just the sulfur, the, the broccoli sprout extract in it and the stable myrosinase. And so now we have sulforazine and you can use this as the product that you could give to your patients who are struggling with chronic inflammation and oxidative stress to not necessarily act as a direct anti-inflammatory antioxidant, but as a way to push the body's natural system to support antioxidation, to support anti-inflammation, support the detoxification pathways naturally. You can use this product to help inhibit the KEEP-1 that is being, or to inhibit the NF-kappa-B that is preventing our natural NRF our natural NRF2 system from working. So how do you use sulforazine for your patients? For general health, we recommend anywhere from two to four capsules per day. But for those of your, for, the, for your patients who are really struggling with chronic inflammatory conditions and lots of oxidative stress, you may want to consider the therapeutic effect maybe four or greater. But each patient's unique, so tighter the, the dosage up with your patients, Get, see where you get an effective value and understand that each patient may need a different dose. I've had such success with sulforazine in my patient base. I hope you'll have the same benefit in your patient base. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, Jason, or anybody at Master Supplements or US Enzymes to help give you some more information. Thank you.